Okay, so pull this up. Um, all right, sorry about that. So can everyone see my screen now? Good. All right, I'm really excited to be here and I'm really thankful that I was asked to present on this topic because it is something that I'm very passionate about and want to um, get the word out about neurodiversity. I feel like it is a new term um, and that a lot of people still have um, a lot to learn about neurodiversity. And so I'm grateful that you guys are all here and that you're interested in learning about the nonprofit that I started and the work that we're doing. Let me change. And if anyone has any questions, you can um, raise your hand and I'll try to get to it. If I don't see it, just call out. All right. So um, I started the Neurodiversity Network in 2019 as a grassroots organization. Um, our mission is to promote the acceptance and belonging of neurodivergent individuals and to help create a more equitable society that values diversity and promotes understanding and respect for neurodiversity. We offer education and training programs, community outreach, support groups, and advocacy meetings. And so a little bit about our logo, there was that bird, um, that is the Sankofa bird. Um, and so in African studies, Sankofa can be translated to go back to the past and bring forward that which is useful. And I just thought that was like a really powerful symbol because I want people to learn and understand um, the history of people with disabilities and how far we've come, but also how much more we have to do in order to create a more equitable society for people with disabilities. So I just really wanted that to be uh, a part of our logo and our mission so that we're not forgetting about history and repeating history. And then the rainbow infinity sign is just a symbol that's used for neurodiversity, symbolizes the spectrum. So there's a huge spectrum um, when thinking about autism or ADHD or any kind of neurodivergence. Some people may need more support. Some people may need less supports, um, have different sensory needs, and they can kind of fall all within different places on the spectrum. Um, and so that's why we use uh, infinity symbol and then just the rainbow sign to symbolize that there's so many differences that exist within these different diagnoses. And so my passion came because of my son. His name is TJ. He is autistic. He's eight years old. Um, when TJ was first diagnosed, I was in grad school. And I did not know much about autism or disabilities um, just because I wasn't exposed to that. I myself have a learning disability, but my parents really didn't um, talk about it or anything. It was just something where I received services. So I received um, extra time when completing tests, um, separate locations so that I could focus. Um, now learning that I have ADHD, so that's something else that I've been exploring. My son has ADHD as well. And so um, when I was in school, I started doing research about what is autism? How can I support him? How can I help him to grow and thrive with um, this new diagnosis? And I just started to learn so much about neurodiversity in the beginning, it was very negative. So I remember going to, at the time, um, one of my supervisors and her having like a very negative reaction to autism and just saying like, if you need time off, you can take some time off to process it. And I didn't really understand because I was like just ignorant to what autism um, 
meant and looked like. And so I kind of went down this rabbit hole of um, trying to get all the information that I could, like I was saying. And at first it was negative, but then I did find like the neurodiversity movement. And I thought, this is great. I wish more people knew about this side to disabilities and autism in general. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, this negative thing that people are afraid of or um, where we're trying to control or change the person. Yes, we do want to support the person that has a disability, but um, we don't want them to feel like something's wrong with them. And so with the neurodiversity movement, the whole thought is that we exist in this society that was created for typically developing people without disabilities. And so um, the the system is really the problem, not the individual who has the disability. And so I think I'll get into this later, but um, some people believe that the person with the disability is the problem and that they need to ch to change to fit into the system. And I just feel like that's just not fair. That's very problematic and can cause a lot of issues um, for the person that's marginalized. And so here are some basic terms just as we go along. So neurodivergent, a person whose brain functioning differs from what's considered normal. Neurotypical, a person whose brain functioning is considered nor normal. And then neurodiverse is a group of people with differences um, in their brains. And so this would be considered a neurodiverse group. So neurodiversity, it's the natural variation in human um, neurocognitive function. We have the neurodiversity paradigm. So no one type of brain function is right or best. And that's what I was just trying to explain that um, there doesn't have to be this power dynamic that currently exists. And then we have the neurodiversity movement, which is a social justice movement that um, seeks civil rights, equality, equity um, for everyone. And these are some of the diagnoses that fall under the neuro divergent umbrella, ADHD, sensory processing disorder, just to name a few, but you can kind of go down the list. This is a non-exhaustive list. And so I show this um, wheel of power next so that people can kind of take um, some time to look at it and see where they fall on this um, wheel of power because where you fall is kind of going to influence your worldview. And that's what I've started to kind of understand with the neurodiversity movement. Um, a lot, it is still something that people are coming to, I guess, prioritize. Um, it, it's been very difficult to get people on board with supporting the movement because if it doesn't personally affect you and you're not tied to it, it can be hard for you to relay or understand the value or importance of the movement. So people in the middle are considered people with the most power. That would be someone who is white, a citizen, doesn't have a disability. Um, you can kind of go through and read all of those things. And the, the farther out you go, the more marginalized you become. Um, and so there's this idea of intersectionality where someone has multiple identities that put them at risk of being victimized or mistreated or abused. And so when thinking about my son, TJ, he is an African-American boy who has a disability. Um, he is non-speaking. He does speak in you know, a few words to kind of get his needs across, but he doesn't, he's not at the stage where he can have conversations like fully and express himself. So he is you know, at more risk to um, get taken advantage of or be discriminated against. And so with the Neurodiversity Network, I really want to focus on supporting the, the people like TJ um, who are more at risk 
than others. And thought this was really cool too. So I just put it in, but if you look at the, and this is for the people that are visual learners, we're at the Neurodiversity Network. I kind of juggle between equity and justice, but the ultimate goal that I remind myself is that we want to fight for justice. Um, and if you look at the first picture, there's a little child trying to um, get access to the fruit. They don't have the same opportunities or um, access as the other kid because of reasons outside of their um, control. And it's just not the best situation. Next would be equality, which I think a lot of people think is the best thing. Like, oh, we want equality. But again, as you can see, the child now has a ladder, but they're still not able to access the opportunities that exist. You go to the next box, ex equity. The child can get the fruit now because they that you added more supports, you added more resources, but there's still like this power dynamic of like this one has more um, fruit versus the other one not it not being evenly distributed is what I mean. Um, so we really want to focus on creating a system where there's equal opportunities distributed amongst both people because both people are valuable. And um, I just use this visual as an example to get people to understand what it really means to be just and um, supporting the people that we serve. And so I'm gonna show this video and hope the audio works. Content warning, this film contains okay. description of the experience of being restrained. This section of the film has a warning immediately before it and is filmed in black and white to make it easy to skip past if you decide not to watch it. Hi, I am Grant Blasco, a college-bound high school senior. My name is Jordan Zimmerman. I communicate by typing on an iPad. My name is Endeavor, and I'm a multimodal communicator. Hi, I'm Isaiah Graywell from Canada. I type and spell to communicate. We're all autistic and we're unable to rely on speech to be understood. Most of us are non-speaking. Some of us can speak a little or from time to time. People have a lot to say about us. They write stories and biographies. They produce plays and make movies about us, but they are not listening to us. Just because I cannot speak does not mean I don't hear. I hear everything people say to me or about me. I may not show understanding in my face, but I know and understand. Not a word said escapes my so strong ears. We may be non-speaking, and need help with many things. But that doesn't mean we can't contribute to a book, a play, or a movie. If you always leave us out, people think we are not able to participate. That's why most people don't realize that we have a contribution to make. Include us, and you will see that we have so much to give. To anyone who wishes to represent non-speaking people, I ask that you communicate with us directly. This representation of non-speaking people leaves us more vulnerable to abuse. I should not be left out of conversations or presumed incompetent simply because I don't rely on spoken language. There needs to be more representation of diverse autistic identities. The media often shapes how we view ourselves and how others around us view and esteem our place in society. When there is lack of representation or improper representation, it directly feeds into the internalization of stigma, where your membership in a group is the very cause of your negative self-esteem, feelings of inferiority, and even feelings of self-hatred. If your story says there's no hope, people may not realize how many of us can share solutions about how to support non-speaking children and adults. People who write about us tell the world what they think is best. Other people who follow their example could hurt us rather than help us. To be treated like a child just because you can't communicate in the usual ways is humiliating and traumatic. The way to demean me is to speak to me as if I am a baby. I don't like people talking about me like I am not there. Some books and movies include scenes of restraint. 
these can be painful to watch. You may want to fast forward the next few seconds that are in black and white, where an autistic survivor talks about his experiences with prone restraint. Every escalation was blamed 100% on me, no matter if they had just done something illegal to me, cornered me, taunted me, taken something I needed, whatever. Your body is tensing up. Your breathing tightens up. Your fists want to clench. You can feel your body betraying you. You can fight or fold. It's up to you. You are hitting the ground either way. You are face down on the floor. You may relax. You may beg. You may play dead. None of it works. If you show pain, they will show you more pain. I thought I was suffocating and I called out to say so, and they laughed. The way people who use restraint talk, you might think it is an almost surgical procedure. It's not. It is a fight with a predetermined winner. Who isn't you? How do we get it right? Consult non-speaking autists from the start and at key points throughout your project. Read our blogs and books. Watch our movies and videos. Learn about our lives. If you have a voice, you can use it to help bring dignity back for the members of the more marginalized autistics. Let's change the plot lines and the narratives around non-speaking autistics so more and more are allowed to be visible in society and avail of opportunities in all kinds of areas. Then we will truly see more and more non-speaking autistic actors who will be able to provide us with more positive and authentic representations. Ask us. Listen to us. Nothing about us without us. Okay, so I show that because I can't do a neurodiversity presentation and not show it. I want as many people to see that video as possible just to continue to raise awareness and um, get people to understand um, different perspectives and hear from the voices of people maybe you never heard from. Um, let me put this in full screen. So, yes, but um, going back to Neurodiversity Network and why I started it, um, so with my son, there was an incident that occurred where he was in, this was when he was in preschool. Um, I was working, so he went to preschool, and then he would go to, like, after school care at a daycare, um, and there was a situation where one of the teachers physically restrained him and he ended up kicking the teacher in the face. And I pulled him out of that um, program and just tried to understand how it even got to that level of like escalation of trying to restrain him and came to find, I just found out that the, the teacher just wasn't trained. She didn't really know how to work with kids who have disabilities. She's not a special education teacher, just a, you know, daycare worker. He wasn't listening to um, directions for him to sit. So she thought, I'll just, you know, forcefully sit him down and kind of show him like, this is what you're supposed to do, which is very traumatic and not really helpful. Um, and then also working at, um, so full time, I do work at People Inc. with people um, in group homes and kind of seeing some of the education that is still needed with the staff that support them every day. Um, you know, a lot of the workers come in with just like a high school diploma um, and they aren't really familiar with disabilities or how to support individuals with disabilities. So they need education, they need training um, so that they're not um, hurting someone. Obviously not on purpose, they wouldn't be doing that, but unintentionally hurting someone or unintentionally I mean so there's two so a, when figuring this out I came to realize that there's two different approaches and a lot of the approaches that are currently used are they fall under the medical or behavioral model and that would be like applied behavioral analysis so you're trying to take a behavior and ex extinguish it or get rid of it to kind of shape and mold the the behavior that we want to see. Um, this is something quick that can be done using reinforcements, intrin um, extrinsic rewards. And so you kind of, so for example, 
a teacher would say, TJ, sit, good job sitting, give the kid, a, you know, a token or candy or something. Now, when learning about this, I started to hear from people with lived experience who went through these programs and expressed that it was very, um, it hurt them mentally. Some even saying it caused stress or trauma. Um, they didn't feel like they were treated as a person. They didn't feel like they were understood. It just didn't seem like a relationship was being formed. It was very like there was a power struggle. And so I thought there has to be a better way to work with people who think differently, who communicate differently, who act differently. And so that's when I started to learn about the social model um, and developmental approaches. Put my son in a DIR floor time school so you can take time to kind of look that up if you're interested. But this approach uses um, it's more of like a trauma-informed approach. It kind of lines up with like trauma-informed care. So looking at individual differences, accepting and supporting students, understanding unmet needs, under exploring um, maybe what could be going on, why this person may be displaying these behaviors instead of just trying to punish and reward um, the behaviors away. And so Beneath every behavior, there's a feeling and beneath each feeling is a need. And when we meet that need, rather than focus on the behavior, we begin to deal with the cause and not the symptom. And I remember when I was in grad school, there was, I don't remember who said it, but there was a teacher that I had that gave a story about, um, we were talking about trauma and she gave the story about us as social workers, you see there's a bunch of kids in a river and as social workers, we're trying to help the children pull them out of the river. Um, but I think that the real benefit is going to the front of the river and understanding why are all these kids in the river to begin with so that we can kind of fix the, the root of the problem. And so I think that's where macro level social work comes into play. So with micro level social work, you may be like, counseling the children or the adults that are telling you I had this really traumatic experience as a child or like I never felt like I fit in or I never felt like I belong um and you're trying to help them but then you're just going to keep getting the same kind of clients unless we actually go and figure out what is going on with the school system what is going on with families right now? Um, do you have your hand up? I'm sorry. <laughs> I do. I, I didn't want to interrupt you, but there was someone in the chat who asked about the school that you mentioned that's trauma-informed. I think you called it DIR floor time. Oh, yes. Can you, can you oh, yep. Talk a bit more about that. Yes. So there is um there's some there's some schools in Buffalo we have. So TJ went to Buffalo Hearing and Speech, one of the best schools, but the problem is they only go up to second grade. Um, so he went there from preschool to second grade. They use DIR floor time. Um, that, that's the approach that they use. There's also Born Hava, um, Liberty Post. Um, those are a few that I could think of. They're very, they're very limited. So it's not like something that is out there. A lot of schools use compliance because it is an easier way to get kids to do what you want they just it is like it's science they kind of it started with rats so like I think it was Skinner um they realized that you could reward and punish people to get them to sh do what you want um but it comes at a cost and when we think about like co comorbidity and people with disabilities also having anxiety depression um low self-esteem especially high with people with ADHD I think we need to start trying to understand where is this coming from and why is it so why is the rate so high? And so um, with Neurodiversity Network, we're moving away from compliance based models where we are focusing on modifying a person's behavior to deeper and really getting at the place of internal regulation. So um, this takes longer and schools don't have staff. Maybe they don't have time or patience. Um, teachers are burned out. But with the DIR floor time and developmental approaches, 
You're really taking time to form relationships with your students, just being trauma-informed. If you have a child who um, is maybe spinning in the corner of the classroom, instead of saying, you shouldn't be spinning, come over here and sit down, here's your sticker. You could maybe go in the corner and spin with, with them and say, oh, this is helping to maybe learn about their sensory system. Maybe this is helping to regulate them. Then that child is going to start to trust you and build a relationship with you so that if you were to say, hey, let's go back, we're done spinning, let's go back and sit and do an activity, maybe they're more likely to comply. Um, but that's a whole different presentation. So I will keep moving on. <laughs> and so advocacy and awareness, there's a lot of parents out there. I'm in a bunch of support groups and I really wanted to create neurodiversity network to empower other parents um, because their children, some of these parents are, are, they have their kids on home instruction. So if you have a child who just is having, displaying extreme behaviors that no one can really kind of, as they would say, fix the behavior or make the kids safe in their environment, then they end up on home instruction, which is illegal. A lot of parents don't realize that they have rights and um, the school district really should be working with the parents to, so that the kids' needs are getting met. And sometimes that means you need to modify the way that you're approaching working with a student because obviously it's not working. And so um, I spend a lot of time teaching parents about their rights, um, connecting them with like educational advocates, um, working with them on how to build relationships with the school district, because sometimes it can turn into like a power struggle between parents and the school district. So parents need to kind of learn how to come from a place of um, mutual respect, which can be hard when you feel like, you know, your child is being mistreated. So working with teachers also on understanding how maybe they could be changing their approaches and then working, there's just so many layers also working with teachers and parents, because a lot of the times parents think I need to go to the, st the school district to get what I want and to get things in the IEP when really they could be um, working with the teacher, building a relationship with the teacher. And yes, it's important to have um, a legal document that says my child is entitled to these services. But if you work with the teacher and you say, hey, for example, TJ really enjoys learning about shapes. Can, can I give you some materials? Or that's what I would say. Like I would give her some um, different activities that he enjoys doing at home. And can you somehow build this into to the curriculum so maybe he's more interested in it? Um, so it's really like getting parents um, to learn how to work as a team because really that's what we're trying to do. And so another reason why to choose macro level work, system levels change through empowerment, education, and community organizing. As I said before, if you're a counselor and you're working with, you see a lot of the same issues, sometimes it's really helpful to get to the root of the problem. Um, and understanding, also keeping in mind that the system was built a lot of people say that this is a broken system, but the system was built the way that it was built intentionally, and the system is benefiting the people that it was designed to benefit. And so sometimes people just need to hear that and just understand, like, that's not anything radical. I think some people think, you know, oh, um, I don't want to be seen as like, you know, a troublemaker, because you may see say some things that offend people, but really you're just shining a light and saying like, hey, this is what's really going on. And I, I'm educated and I understand the history of education. I understand the school to prison pipeline. I understand that kids with um, that, are my, that are Black or um, a person of color are more likely to be discriminated against than a child who is white. Um, sometimes you just have to come out and say it. You can say it in a nice way. You don't have to be aggressive or threatening, which... Sometimes even if you're not being that way, it, it will come off that way because some people aren't going to like what um, you have to say. So in a lot of our advocacy groups, I spend time talking with parents on 
how to say things in a way that's more palatable to others. I'm going to skip this video, but I'll share this PowerPoint. Um, this is just a quick video that kind of explains how to community organize, um, if that's something that you're interested in learning more about. And I just love that picture right there. Don't panic. There's the big fish. A lot of parents feel like they're in silos and they're by themselves and they're up against this big school district who's going to tell them what's best for their kids. But it could be really powerful. And when parents come together, go to school board meetings, organize, um, rely on one another so that they can they can have people that have their back and they don't feel like they're up against something alone. And people are more let more um, people will listen to you when you come together because you are more united and strong in that way. And they, they may not to intimidate, but it's bigger. It's better when you have um, a number of people behind you. All right. So I'll also um, just looking at time, just go through this briefly. I kind of talked a little bit about the research. So what I found with the behavioral approaches, um, versus social models and kind of collecting data to see how many schools are out there so that we can highlight the needs that exist. And there is a huge, huge need for more social developmental approaches with older kids. I don't know of any that exist. It stops at second grade. Um, a lot of, like I said, the school, the school system was designed to have like this power dynamic of compliance and control. That's just the way it is. So after Buffalo Hearing and Speech, there's really no programming that exists where um, uh, kids kind of feel empowered. Unless you're typically developing and you are wealthier, maybe you go to a private Montessori school. But again, you're going to come up with some issues if you have a disability or an IEP and you need your needs met. Um, in a different way, you might not get accepted into that type of programming. So that is a huge issue. Um, defining your mission statement, building your team, you're always going to want a team of people who not only are passionate, but also have the information that you're looking for to kind of push your mission along. So you're going to want people who know about politics, who understand um, fundraising, who know about graphic designing, you're just going to want to really be strategic with building your team um, and then fundraising, um, incorporating your nonprofit. I worked with a lawyer to do this. So you may want to look into some um, free lawyer programs. I know there's the Volunteer Lawyer Project. Um, apply for your 501c3 status, get your EIN. And the EIN is really going to help you when people are donating if they want to write that off on their taxes. Um, they're going to need that. And then website design, social media, just to get your presence out there and known so that people can start coming to you and understanding and learning about what you have to offer. And then um, events. So you're going to need volunteers. You're going to need support from the community because you can't do it all alone. So just really taking time to network. A lot of the networking I do is like at the support groups that I go to or people that I have met from TJ school, um, events that I go to within the disability community. And so we, like I said, do support groups um, for neurodivergent adults. We do advocacy meetings the first Tuesday of every month where people can come and learn about how to organize and advocate um, we do tabling and outreach at different events to get the word out about neurodiversity and how to be trauma informed when working with individuals with disabilities. And we just had our first event at Cradle Beach, was, which was a conference, had a bunch of different people coming. There were occupational therapists, speech um, therapists to come and talk about different approaches that could be used within um, the, the disability community. And so a lot of the trauma-informed approaches are kind of hidden and you have to go out and you have to like do the work. So I'll have therapists message me and say, I want to learn about neurodiversity. And is there a class that you offer that I, that you could take? And I'll send them recommendations on different websites that I actually included in 
this PowerPoint, um, different books, but a lot of the information that I've learned has been self-taught, whether it's through books or YouTube um, video. And the best information that you're going to get are through um, self-advocates, which is very important. People that actually have the lived experience, because you may have an, a person who doesn't have that lived experience. And that's how we kind of end up in this situation where they think that they know what's best. So like this kid is not listening to me, huge behavior problem. They think, okay, I'm going to punish and reward this kid to get them do, to do what I want not really thinking about the long-term effects that it's going to have on that child, not taking into consideration what they may, may be thinking or feeling, and it just kind of perpetuates the issue. So you really, when you're doing your research and you're trying to learn more about um, any issue, you should go to people who have the lived experience and yes, use like your cited, um, you know, research, but I'm starting to question that a little bit, kind of, you got to use some critical thinking skills when you're researching things online. Um, so this is our website. I just wanted to show it just in case you're interested. We have our, you know, welcome, um, our land acknowledgement, and then this is our logo. Um, just put this together through Wix, which is a um, website building platform. So it, you'll definitely want to kind of figure out what is the most effective for you in terms of cost, but this worked for us. Um, here's where people can make a donation. In the past, I've just reached out to different organizations and brands. So like, for example, this kid, um, we got a Yodo. So I reached out to Yodo, asked them if they would donate. They donated like 20 Yodo boxes, which are basically just there, um, you can kind of put um, different cards in there and they can play mindfulness music. There's just, they can tell stories. There's just so much that kids can do with it. And it really helps um, if you have like a sensory or a calm down space to just put it in there. It's very kid friendly to use. Um, so this is the link for our advocacy meeting and then volunteer opportunities. Um, we are looking for a neurodi neurodiversity affirming therapist. This is huge. We have a bunch of people that have reached out and said that they are very interested in finding a therapist that understands neurodiversity, that isn't ableist, um, that will understand the struggles that I am currently facing and offer me actual solutions that help me. So a lot of people, I'll just give one example, people with ADHD going to therapy and then maybe a therapist, them saying, I'm having a really hard time, um, you know, staying organized, being on time for work. Um, I just feel really bad about myself. And then the therapist giving them um, like a solution that doesn't work for them saying, oh, maybe you should try using a calendar or an agenda um, so that you can stay organized. But if you truly understand ADHD, then you would understand that their brain, the way that their brain works, executive functioning skills may be lacking. Of course, they've thought like I should use an agenda. Have they done it yet? Probably not because of the way that their brain is wired. And so um, really understanding that working with the person on understanding their brain and maybe they might need medication to help with that. Maybe they work on mindfulness. Maybe they work on um, activities that ex in, improve executive functioning skills, um, and then helping them to work through that shame because a lot of people feel like um, it is a deficit of them as a person. Like something is just, I'm just not a good person. Something is wrong with me when it's really not that. It's just their brain is wired differently. And so um, we really need therapists to understand what it means to be autistic, what it means to have ADHD and how people can start to embrace themselves so they can start working on their self-esteem issues and they can start feeling empowered and happy to be, you know, alive in this world. And so um, consulting services, and this was our event at Cradle Beach. We had a ASL interpreter, which is also important when working with clients, just wanna throw that out there. If you ever have a client 
that is deaf or hard of hearing, making sure you're advocating that your agency actually provides funding for those types of services because they are needed. And um, currently that is something that is just not prioritized. And so here are some resources. We have Autism um, Self-Advocacy Network, Lived Experience Educator. You guys can kind of go through there if you're interested in learning more from people with lived experiences, Stop the Shock. There are still people that are going through shock treatment as a way to, um, it's like an adversive treatment to get people to do what you want them to do, basically. And the reason that this is allowed is because um, they ruled it under medical. So like, there's really nothing that we just need to keep advocating. There's really nothing that can be done. Um, it, it did go through, I think, court system because we were trying to, people were trying to get that banned and organized, but the court system ruled that it is allowed because it's for medical treatment purposes, which is just a whole other thing. Um, and then Alliance Against um, Seclusion and Restraint, there are still people being secluded and restrained which is just not okay. If it's a safety issue and someone is trying to like run into the street or harm themselves, of course, keep that person safe. But um, seclusion rooms, they still exist. I've been to one in Buffalo. It's just not okay. We just need to move past it at this point. And people need to start saying like, this is unacceptable. We need to do more um, ableism, ageism, all of those things combined. And so this is my contact and I wanted to save time for if there's any questions. Um, so let me stop sharing. Um, well, claps, uh, thank you. Um, I'm impressed with so many aspects of um, your work and I've learned so much through our, our conversations in this presentation. Um, I have some questions or a couple at least, but I wanted to prioritize the folks who are here. So I know that some people put a couple things in the chat, but um, yeah, I'm hoping that you can give me, um, I'm hoping that some people in the audience can uh, provide some questions or comments. Thanks for the claps. Oh, uh, Chris, um, Christian. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, so, um, uh, well, thank you for presenting, first of all. Uh, this is a topic that is also personally very important to me, and it's something that I'm very passionate about as well. Um, I actually just did a presentation on neurodiversity in my trauma and human rights class on Monday, and um, that went well. Um, but my question is kind of relating to neurodiversity, specifically in like higher education settings, which is something that um, I've tried to shine light on through the projects that I've worked on in the social work program at UB. Mm -hmm. And where I'm kind of having trouble with is maybe getting people to kind of like buy into this concept and invest in this concept and maybe do something about it, mm -hmm. I guess. Because um, UB has a ton of resources that can be utilized, I, I think, when it comes to neurodiversity stuff. Like we have this inclusive design and environmental access center mm -hmm. and they use a lot of like universal design in their architecture and their structure which could be a really good thing to implement more of on our campus to make it more not only like trauma-informed but more welcoming and just more accommodating for people of for everyone I think that's the point of universal design it's like regardless yeah. of if you have a disability physical or intellectual it's really supposed to be including everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a GA at the Career Design Center at UB as well. So I'm trying to propose this idea because neurodivergent students in higher education or adults do have trouble with like, yes. you know, their careers. There's just a lack of career readiness. And I see that huge gap there, but no one's really biting. Mm -hmm. So do you have any suggestions on maybe like how to approach this topic in higher education settings? Yeah, I 
I would say um, definitely come to our advocacy meetings if you can. There are a bunch of students, um, one from SUNY Fredonia, one from UB as well, who has shared that they just don't feel like it's sensory friendly. Um, at On the campus, there's no place for students to kind of go if they want to like decompress and like be in a place that's calming. Um, even the wellness centers seem to be overwhelming for them. And so I think the, the biggest thing would be going to accessibility services, but not going alone. So coming with a group of students who have the same thoughts and ideas and the same struggles as you and highlighting, this is an issue and how can we come together to um, solve this? The, when I have success, it's when I come with solutions. So if you come with a solution, like are there any spaces on campus that we can look into changing that can be considered like um, a sensory or calm down room. And I think like, I feel really bad for the older kids and the adults because they're the ones that really struggle with getting their needs met because like the older you get, the less sympathy people have for you. And it's more like, okay, that's a you problem and you need to figure it out. Um, it's very individualism type of thinking and um, it becomes like a character flaw. Your disability becomes like a flaw of yours. So like you, for example, say you're constantly late with um, sending in your papers and your professors are just, you know, they're just not having it and you don't have an accommodation because maybe you went undiagnosed this whole time and you were somehow able to get by without any accommodations. There's a lot of people that were able to do that. Um, People just give up and they just drop out of school or that's where that those mental health issues come in where they start to have anxiety or low self-esteem. And so I guess my biggest advice would be to get students that are like minded, come up with a plan of like, what is it that you need? What is it? What are the requests that you have? And then go to the accessibility. You have to kind of know who's in charge of what and they are in charge of making the environment inclusive. So you need to hold them accountable. And it may feel very like awkward and uncomfortable, but that's just advocacy. And I always feel awkward and uncomfortable because you're kind of, you're essentially calling someone out and saying, you're not doing, you know, what you're saying that you're going to do, but you can always do it in a nice way. It doesn't have to be aggressive. I think people are traumatized or stressed. And so their fight or flight or freeze response comes out when they're kind of battling like, people that are in positions of power, they don't do it intentionally. It just comes out that way, but kind of working on like, you know, you're triggered, you're upset. Let me take a couple deep breaths and present this in a way where it's more palatable. Yeah, I mean, I've def I've talked to people from accessibility resources. Um, I'm a student with ADHD myself and I wasn't diagnosed until I was an adult too. Mm -hmm. And like, I have both of my younger siblings are also on the autism spectrum as well. So, I mean, there's some probably genetic stuff behind that. Yeah. But like, even though accessibility resources, they talk about this topic a lot. I mean, one of the representatives from there, she had asked me directly if I wanted to speak on a student panel at um, this um, conference thing last semester. Um, but even with AR res AR or accessibility resources, there are limitations in what they're able to provide and the types of accommodations that they're able to give students because it's nothing really more than like what an extension on exams, which we don't even get exams or extension extension as far as like deadlines on assignments. But like more more than that, there's not really many options right now. So I think yeah, just really I know. Um... If it gets to the point of um, getting an education or educational lawyer involved, the, the student from Fredonia that I'm working with, he's at that level right now. Um, you know, there was a in incident that occurred where they thought that it was like favoritism when it wasn't. It was just like, you know, um, accommodations. If you need to take it to that level, take it to that level because you do have rights as someone with a disability. And I think. Um, making sure that when you're communicating with accessibility services, if you're giving them solutions um, that and they're just not being receptive, you need to get outside support 
I would definitely do it. You can also look into Access VR, which I really have not, I'm not sure how helpful they are, but they work with higher education, um, people with disabilities. Um, so that's like a local resource. And then there's also Learning, Disab Learning Disability Associates of Western New York is another place. Um, and also before even get it, going to a lawyer, sometimes mediation helps. There's a free mediation service through Child and Family Services. You would, I would, I'm not sure if it would be available for um, college students, but it's a question to ask. And if they don't have med mediation services available to you, you could ask them if they have any recommendations of like mediation. Um, and then if, if accessibility services are saying that they're limited or it's above their head, asking them, okay, well, who can I talk to next? Who's in the position of power? Who is above you? So asking those questions and kind of working your way up because the squeaky wheel gets fixed. That's just the way it is. Um, so yeah, is there well, any other questions? Oh. We're actually um, a minute over and I oh. um, already am thankful for the time that you've given us, um, Adriana. I know you're, you're busy. Um, I'm so impressed with um, so, some of the non-social work things you, you've done, like even the website, like, you know, you, you don't learn that in interventions or, or human rights. So it's, it's a lot of just um, self-taught and, and, um, a lot of that is um, passion, critical thinking, things like that. So I had a couple other questions um, sent to me in the chat. Um, are you okay if people email you with, you with questions or advice, Adriana? Yeah, that's fine. So I will, um, um, later today, I'll send out your PowerPoint if you can send that to me. Um, and I'll also send out your contact info so that people can contact you that way. Um, but um, thank you so much. Um, super impressive um, and uh, thought provoking too. So um, thank you. and. Um, have a nice rest of your day. Thank you, guys. Bye.